Sergeant Terrence Williams from the 22nd Security Forces Squadron, and I will be your master of ceremony for today's ceremony. Before we begin, we respectfully ask that you silence all electronic devices, and we also ask that during the singing of the National Anthem, that civilians please stand and place their right hand over their heart while military members render a salute. Please stand for the arrival of the official party. So proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Well, before I get started, uh, we're supposed to have a flyover, so I apologize if uh, the flyover comes here shortly. So uh, again, if you see it, look in awe because it's a beautiful sight. We are privileged to have some distinguished guests here in attendance this morning, but we ask that you please hold your applause until I finish reading all the names. Our guest speaker for today's ceremony is General Stephen Lorenz, United States Air Force, retired. Representing 29th District State Senator Aletha Faust Goodo, the Mayor of Wichita, Mayor Jeff Longwell, the Mayor of Derby, Mayor Randy White, from the Kansas House of Representatives, Representative John Carmichael.
we'll blame that on the overcast. They couldn't see the, the sights there, so. Uh, as I was, from the office of Senator Moran, Deputy State Director, Mr. Mike Zamerzla. Also from the office, office of Senator Moran, State Military Liaison, Mr. Mike Hellstab. Assistant Adjutant General, Air Component and Commander of the Kansas Air National Guard, Brigadier General J.C. Landers. The Sedgwick County Manager, Brigadier General Mike Scholes, United States Air Force, and his wife, Jessica. From the City of Wichita, Council Members Levanta Williams. From the City of Derby, Council Members John McIntosh and Mark Statz, as well as Jack Hesleff. Wichita Mitchell Ch Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Gary Plummer. Derby Chamber of Commerce, Mrs. Lisa Woosley, Mrs. Iva Williams, Miss Sue Ann Brunty, Mrs. Elizabeth Stanton, Mrs. Katie Carlson, and Ms. Lynn Price. Vice President and General Manager of Wichita Operations for Sphero Aerosystems, Mr. Vic McMullen. Vice President of Government and Public Affairs for Coke Industries, Mr. Mark Nichols. Vice President, Cox Business, Mr. Mark Tucker. The President of Butler Community College, Dr. Kim Kroll. The President of Friends University, Dr. Amy Carey. The Commander, 22nd Air Refueling Wing, Colonel Albert Miller and his wife, Kim. The Commander, 184th Intelligence Wing, Colonel David Weishauer. The Commander, 931st Air Refueling Wing, Colonel Mark Larson and his wife, Angela. The Commander, 190th Air Refueling Wing, Colonel Jared France. The Command Chief, 22nd Air Refueling Wing, Chief Master Sergeant Sean Hughes and his wife, Lisa. The Command Chief, 184th Intelligence Wing, Chief Master Sergeant Thane Stauffer. The Command Chief, 190th Air Refueling Wing, Chief Master Sergeant John Von Burns. And lastly, the engineer who was on board the first KC-135 delivered to the Air Force, Chief Master Sergeant Bobby McCaslin, United States Air Force, retired. We would also like to extend a warm welcome to all other commanders, Golden Eagles, honorary commanders, chiefs, first sergeants, and friends and family of Team McConnell. I would like to begin today's ceremony by discussing the extensive history and impressive accomplishments of the KC-135 during its 60 years of service. In November 1953, the Commander-in-Chief of Strategic Air Command, General Curtis E. LeMay, called for the Air Force to acquire 200 jet tankers. On 31 August 1956, KC-135 Strato Tanker, serial number 55-3118, took honors as the first KC-135 to take flight. That particular aircraft is closer than you think because it's positioned right behind me. In namesake, it's referred to as the City of Renton. Following that flight, the 93rd Air Refueling Squadron, based at Castle Air Force Base, California, received the first KC-135 on 28 June 1957. The KC-135 has played an integral part in numerous conflicts throughout American history. It flew an abundance of missions over the course of the Vietnam War, mainly refueling fighter and bomber aircraft conducting strike and bombing missions against targets north and south of the demilitarized zone. Air crews risked their lives regularly to save fuel-depleted aircraft. Over the course of the war, KC-135s flew 194,687 sorties, accomplished 813,378 in-flight refuelings, delivering 1.4 billion gallons of fuel, and accumulated 911,364 flight hours. The error in the year of 1986 was also an impressive year for the KC-135. On 14 April, 10 KC-135s aided an operation of El Dorado Canyon, which aimed to retaliate against Libya, following acts of terrorism against American citizens. Also on 19 November of that same year, aircraft number 62-3254, dubbed Cherokee Rose, flew 16 world time-to-climb records in four different weight classes. 
beating the Soviet Union's Yak-42 transport aircraft. Additionally, during Operation Desert Shield, the KC-135 filled a small but essential role as personnel and cargo transport. During the Operation Buildup, six KC-135s moved 680 personnel and 200 tons of cargo. During Operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm, KC-135s flew a combined of 131,000 flying hours and 28,000 sorties. More recently, the KC-135 has been vital to Operation Iraqi Freedom, where the aircraft provided fuel to the very first air combat mission of that operation. The KC-135, along with air crew and maintainers, continued to lead the way, supporting global war and terrorism missions beyond Iraqi Freedom, including Operations New Dawn, Inherit Resolve, Freedom Sentinel, Enduring Freedom, and various contingencies in, in and around Southwest Asia. In all, tankers have completed 178,786 sorties, 745,259 flying hours, transporting 52,168 passengers, hauling 1,696 short tons of cargo, and offloaded 8.67 billion pounds of fuel to 601,210 receivers. Like its history, the KC-135 will continue to fuel the fight, making crucial impacts stateside and around the world. Today, we are privileged to introduce our special guest speaker, General Stephen Lorenz, United States Air Force, retired. General Lorenz graduated from the United States Air Force Academy in 1973 and attended undergraduate pilot training at Craig Air Force Base, Alabama. He, was flown, he has flown several different aircraft, including the KC-135 Alpha and Romeo models, as well as the EC-135 variant employed for Airborne Command and Control. The general commanded at every level during his career, including at our very own 22nd Air Refueling Wing, when it was located at March Air Force Base, California. He also served as a Commandant of Cadets at the United States Air Force Academy, concluded his distinguished career as a Commander, Air Education and Training Command. General Lorenz is best known for his Lorenz on Leadership, a series of principles and publications which have shaped the Air Force leaders at all levels and inspired the next generation of airmen to study the habits of being an effective leader. We could not be more honored to introduce an extraordinary leader with an extensive tanker background to lead us in celebrating the 60th anniversary of the KC-135. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is with my distinct pleasure and honor to welcome our guest speaker, General Lorenz. Okay, you want... Ah. i tell you what, you want me to come down there? Huh? Is it working now? All right. By the way, I always like to start off with a bang. But anyway, uh, there's so many distinguished visitors. I want to thank the leadership, the political leaders, and the leadership of the, and the agent, deputy agent general and everyone. So I'm not going to announce them all, but I will tell you what. Why don't I just announce Chief McCausland, who was there at the big venting. Or if you'd stand up. And let's give him a big <laughs> the, um, My family is tied to Kansas. My wife, Leslie, sitting there is a rock chalk Jayhawk. She went to KU. And my sister is a graduate of Derby High. When my dad, yes, my dad was stationed here in 1971 and 1973 as a 381st Vice Missile Wing Commander. That's ancient history, but I just thought I'd throw that to all the people from Kansas. Okay, so uh, it's an honor to be here at McConnell Air Force Base on the celebration of the 60th anniversary of the first flight of the KC-135. Before I begin, I'd like to do a shout out from two other former commanders of the 22nd Air Refueling Command. They are Lieutenant General Mike Gould, U.S. Air Force retired, who lives in Colorado Springs, where we live, 
and Lieutenant General Michelle Johnson, who is currently the superintendent of the United States Air Force Academy. They were both commanders of the 22nd while it was here. And I just, they wanted me to say to the members of the local community of Wichita and Derby and all the cities around here, hi, and also to the current members of the 22nd Air Refueling Wing, say hi to you all too. So, what I'm gonna to talk to you, this is gonna be technical, all right? So you're gonna to have to follow me. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of air refueling and how we got here and where we're headed in the future, all right? So, in all my experiences in 37 years in the Air Force, flying the 135 brings back some of the best memories I've ever had. When one looks for a single common denominator for the success we've enjoyed in the Air Force during the last 69 years, it has to be in-flight refueling. It's really a force multiplier. I almost think everyone here knows the story of the famous flight in January 1929. There's no design, excuse me, there's no denying that Major Spots and his crew accomplished something remarkable 87 years ago when they stayed aloft for over six days. How many of you know the story of the question mark? Raise your hand. How many were alive in 1929? Oh, okay. Oh, thank you, Chief. I <laughs> Okay. In my book, the, un, the relatively unheralded accomplishments of those who refueled the question mark in flight was the more significant achievement of actually refueling the question mark. They were called refueling planes number one and two, as they were called, flown by Lieutenants Ross Hoyt and Otis Moon, together offloaded about 40 tons of material, including 5,600 gallons of gasoline, 245 gallons of oil, meals, water, battery, and other supplies. The feats of airmanship on balance were about the same, about the refueler and the refuel. But what those tankers accomplished that week, giving an aircraft virtually unlimited range, think about that, made air, air power during the last 87 years the primary element of United States military strength throughout the world. Strategic bombers could not have been the deterrence they were in the 50s when they alone held the Russian bear at bay, nor could they have played an essential role in the strategic triad during the Cold War. And today, our bombers and fighters could not deploy as they do to protect American interests all over the world. All of these things were and are possible only because of aerial tankers, like the one behind us. Without in-flight refueling, it's hard to imagine what the world would be like today. In 1981, I became the aide to the commander of Air Force Logistics Command, a gentleman named General James P. Mullins. He was commissioned in 1949, and he had the honor of flying our very first tanker, which was called the KB-29M. In a speech he gave 30 years ago at Castle Air Force Base at the 93rd Air Refueling Squadron, which I had the honor to command, okay, he told the story of how it was to fly a refueling mission in the early days of air-to-air -air refueling. Now, this is going to get technical, all right? So I want you to hang in with me. I'm going to try and do it with my hands because I'm reading this because it's very, very confusing. So just bear with me. Okay, here's what he said. Our tankers, armed only with the route of flight of the receiver aircraft, a rendezvous point in time, were flown to intercept the receiver on a collision course, okay? Using electronic single signals from the receiver, the radar operator on board the tanker guided the KB-29M through a 45 degree offset maneuver around behind the receiver aircraft until it could be picked up visually by the tanker pilot and flown in a position above and to the receiver's left. Okay, so we're coming at it like this, 45 degrees, he comes around behind. Okay, boom operators, work with me here, all right? Okay, and so he's, he's, and he's above, all right? From the tanker, a cable called the contact line was lowered 
at the end of which was a 50-pound lead weight. The receiver also trailed a cable called the hauling line from its receiving, refueling receptacle located in the table, tail, tail. So they, they're both dragging out lines, okay? A grappling hook, now think about this, they're flying along at a couple hundred miles an hour. A grappling hook at the end of the hauling line caught the tanker's contact line during a crossover maneuver in which the tanker slid from the left to the right side of the receiver, almost literally over the receiver's vertical stabilizer. So they're like this, this is the tanker, this is the receiver, slides over like this, they catch the wires, okay? With the receiver hauling line engaged, a winch in the tanker reeled in both lines. I, I'm not making this up, okay? <laughs> the refueling operator in the tanker separated the lines, then attached the receiver's hauling line to the refueling hose nozzle, and at a prearranged light signal, the receiver, using a winch, pulled the hose out of the tanker, okay, and into the receptacle of the tail of the receiver, the tail of the receiver. Are you still with me? Okay. When the hose nozzle was seated in the receiver's receptacle and locked with hydraulic toggles, a contact made signal was flashed to the tanker, which by then was above and to the right. This is the tanker, here's the receiver, okay and slightly behind the receiver, behind the receiver, and fuel transfer began. Holding the tanker in position, since its left wing, okay, was in the prop watch of receivers three and four engines, required the tanker literally to be cross-controlled. That way, even with full right aileron, pilots, you with me, okay, to counteract the prop wash, the tanker could be held in position with wings level by relaxing or increasing pressure on the rudders. Chief, you, you know too much. I can, you've been there, done that. I, I can see it. All right. Some 29 B-29s were converted to hose-equipped tankers and designated KB-29Ms. In addition to the pumps, hose, and powered reel at the aft fuselage, each bomb bay was fitted with a jettisonable tank holding 2,300 gallons of fuel. Refueling operations using the loop system was, to say the least, exciting. Originally determined during the flight test to be infeasible. Now think about this. I know we got Boeing people in here. They, they're testing it and they say it's not going to work. Okay? In-flight refuelings were routinely conducted in conditions of poor visibility and turbulence and not without cost. There was many a close call. Where there were refueling units below the AR tracks, the air refueling tracks, okay, they were littered, <laughs> this, littered with lost cables, lead weights, and even hoses. There is a story about a homeowner in Phoenix who was reading in his living room. Now picture this if you're in Derby, Kansas, okay? <laughs> Le reading in his living room when a 50-pound weight, lead weight, tore loose from a tanker's contact line, came crashing through his roof and buried itself in the cement pad which his house was stood. Isn't that amazing? How would you like that as a wing commander? I don't think so. All right. At the same time, Boeing began its KB-29M modification program and also took a design effort to find a more effective system. This led to the development of the flying boom which was first installed on air refueling KB-29Ps in September 1950. Eventually, 116 B-29s were modified with the flying boom, and then they were modified to KB-50s. Now, I hope that some of you know, remember these 29-50s, you know, they're, they're all on museum pieces or on a stick, okay? All right? But both they and the hose tank were replaced by a boom-equipped KC-97s. The principal advantage of the KC-97 over its predecessors lay in the increasing offload capability, cargo carrying capability, and greatly improved boom operator station. But with the advent of fuel guzzling jet bombers like the B-47, there were, there were over 2,000 of them in the Air Force, okay, and B-52, the KC-97's days were numbered, and in 1956, on this very day, 60 years ago, the all-jet KC-135 made its appearance. 
put this in perspective, only 20 years elapsed from the flight of the question mark, the first air-to-air -air refueling, and refueling airplanes one and two in 1929, only 20 years, to the introduction of the KB-29 tanker in 1949. Less than 10 years later, the 135 you are flying were in the inventory. And they remain our principal source of in-flight refueling today, some 60 plus years after they were first introduced, and 87 years after refueling airplanes one and two flew their epic flights. Now let's talk about the mighty KC-135. 60 years ago, on August 31st, 1956, how many of you were alive? Anybody hands? Okay, there are a few, okay. Boeing's KC-135A, 55 okay, with Tex Johnson and Dix, Dix Loesch at the controls, lifted off on its first flight. The flight was 10 days ahead of schedule, and Johnson remarked that it flew better than the prototype, the experimental, experimental Dash 80. The KC-135A's fuel capacity of more than 31,000 gallons, more than double that of the KC-97's 14,900. Furthermore, it was capable of delivering this fuel load at a speed 125 miles faster than the airspeed of the KC-97. KC in all, 820 of it, all variants of the KC-135 were built, with the last KC-135 being delivered to the Air Force in 1965. Of the original KC-135As, more than 415 were modified with the CFM 56 engine produced by CFM International. The re-engine tanker designed e either, uh, designated either the KC-135R or KC-135T can offload 50% more fuel, is 25% more fuel efficient, costs 25% less to operate, and, as demonstrated, 96% quieter than the KC-135A. So to all the people that live around here, thank you for the CMF-56 engine. All right. Today, Air Mobility Command manages 414 of the Stratotankers, of which the Air Force Reserve Command and the Air National Guard fly 247 in support of AMC's worldwide mission. The KC-135 tanker, as you heard, had a long and proud history. I'll just sum summarize it. During the Vietnam War, they flew over 813,000 aerial refuelings of combat aircraft. During the Persian Gulf War, the tanker made 18,700 hookups. Those are, you know, the numbers are just staggering and transferred 278 million pounds of fuel. Today, in the skies around the world, our great crews okay, fly missions every day. Just in the last few years, in the skies over Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria, our crews, along with our maintenance personnel and our support personnel, have enabled our KC-135s to fly 90% of the 29,000 sorties that are required to do that mission, and it grows every day. I love this great old airplane. It has served our nation well and continues to do so on a daily basis. The airplane helps our military maintain our great nation as a world power and will for many years to come. In fact, the Air Force estimates that the, this great airplane has a lifetime flying hour limit, this is hard to believe, of 39,000 hours, and that the current fleet all have between 12 and 14,000 flying hours on them. Only 33% of the projected flying hour limit. That's hard to believe, but that's what they say. <laughs> this great workhorse could continue to fly until 2040. 2040. That's when the airplane will be 80 years old. As I said before, I love this airplane. I've got lots and lots of hours in it. Flew lots and lots of missions. <laughs> However... I look forward to when the KC-46 Pegasus arrives here at McConnell Air Force Base and starts on a whole new chapter of air power and air refueling history. Thank you. Thank you, General Lorenz, for those great remarks. At this time, I would ask Ms. Pam Valdez, the Director of Derivative Derivative Fleet Support and Sustainment, Boeing Defense Space and Security, to 
if she would come up forward to give a special presentation honoring the KC 135 and its history. Good afternoon. Good morning, excuse me. Again, my name is Pam Valdez. I'm here from Seattle, Washington, representing the 160,000 employees of the Boeing Company to share in this very, very special day for an aircraft that we also love very dearly. Within the Boeing family, the KC-135 is a giant amongst all of our aircraft. It has deep design roots in our very first swept wing jet aircraft. B, the B-47. If it wasn't for the B-47, the swept wing jet aircraft that evolved from the Boeing 367-80 would not have occurred. And in speaking with some of the design engineers over many years, um, they truly attribute this aircraft, all 707s, all commercial jet aircraft, to the, K, or to the B-47 and its original design. The, uh, the prototype aircraft for the 707 now resides in the Smithsonian Institute. The KC-135 is one of 2,000 tankers that the Boeing Company has been privileged to provide the United States Air Force and our allied air forces. A Boeing engineer by the name of Cliff Lysey invented the boom in 1948. We spoke with his family recently. His son, who also worked for Boeing and retired, said that he remembers his dad bringing home the design drawings and working on the kitchen table for the boom. He actually turned those exact design drawings over to the Museum of Flight, which are on display in Seattle, Washington, because it was very unsafe <laughs> to do it with a wire or a hose, a wrench. And the boom was the advent of the, of the special process where you can transfer a tremendous amount of fuel from one aircraft to the other. So that boom led to the KB-29, the KC-97, the KC-135, the KC-10, and now on to the KC-46 Pegasi. The KC-135 had a 10-year production run from the mid-50s to the mid-60s, so not a real long period of time for a production run. It was built, every single one of them, in Renton, Washington, on the shores of Lake Washington, just south of Seattle. They were built by men and women whose skills were honed during World War II. They were built in a factory where all of the single aisle Bo Boeing aircraft were built. All 707s, all 727s, all 757s, and still to this day, all 737s are built in the same exact factory that this aircraft behind me was built in. And currently, the 737 has a very staggering rate of 42 aircraft delivered every month. So the people who provided that workforce are very, very proud of the KC-135. And in particular, the city of Renton and its citizens are extremely proud of this aircraft. The city of Renton has a unique connection with this particular aircraft, aircraft 5-3118. It was the very first KC-135, and it was christened with nose art that said the city of Renton. I've been asked by Dennis Law, the current mayor, mayor of the city of Renton, to read this proclamation to you, to the city of Darby, to the city of Wichita. I'll read it here. Whereas the city of Renton, Washington, is proud to be the home of the Boeing factory which built all U.S. Air Force KC-135 aircraft from 1955 to 1965, which at the peak of production produced 100 aircraft a year. And whereas our citizens and our neighboring cities were honored to provide the citizen workforce who built the KC-135 tanker aircraft fleet, and whereas the KC-135 plays a major role in the defense of the United States and our allies by enabling global reach of airborne strategic and tactical aircraft. And whereas on July 18, 1956, Boeing's first production aircraft, the KC-135 tail number 5-3118, 
was painted with nose art that said City of Renton and christened by the mayor's wife, Sarah Baxter, wife of Mayor Joseph Baxter, thereby indelibly marrying this particular aircraft to our city, our citizens, and our coveted Boeing corporate partners. And whereas the city of Renton and our citizens are honored to recognize the achievements of the United States Air Force and their leadership to operate and maintain this magnificent KC-135 fleet during its 60-year lifetime, and by honoring our city and our workforce, by placing the KC-135 tail number 53318 in a prestigious location at the main gate of McConnell Air Force Base in Wichita, Kansas. And whereas the 60th anniversary of any aircraft is a rare event in the worldwide aerospace industry, it is especially significant that it occurs on the 75th anniversary of the Renton factory and the 100th anniversary of the Boeing Company. Whereas the citizens of Renton, Washington congratulate the United States Air Force, the Boeing Company, and the historic 60th anniversary of the KC-135, therefore I, Dennis Law, Mayor of Renton, Washington, do hereby proclaim August 31st, 2016 to be KC-135, aircraft 53118, City of Renton, 60th anniversary day. Thank you, Ms. Valdez. Colonel Miller, would you please come forward and offer closing comments? Absolutely. Uh, as is often my role in these ceremonies, it's to come up and say thank you. Thank you to so many different people that had a part in this. General Lorenz, thank you for honoring us as our guest speaker today. Uh, absolutely wonderful words describing the history of air refueling, the history of the 135, and the impact our airmen have had making our Air Force the best Air Force in the world, and you can attribute it to the 135 uh, airmen that fix, fuel, and fly these wonderful aircraft. And we can touch any place on the globe in a matter of hours because of this capability. And that's, you know, if we want to come to a contingency that requires some humanitarian aid, or whether that contingency requires some kinetic effect, it often is the case that there is a 135 out in front of that effort to make that happen for our nation. I'd be remiss if I didn't thank uh, several other entities. Tech Sergeant Williams, thank you for being our MC today. The Honor Guard, as always, does a wonderful job. Uh, the chaplain sent me an email this morning and said he had said an extra prayer to make sure the weather was going to hold out. <laughs> so a special thanks to him. To all of our distinguished visitors, community partners, industry partners, Ms. Valdez, thank you for that proclamation uh, from the city of Renton, uh, which has very close ties to this aircraft uh, that's now the keeper of the planes here in Wichita. Uh, the whole group that Senior Master Sergeant Bissonette led to make sure that we had everything in place to make this an absolute first class ceremony celebrating a key milestone in this aircraft's history. And it's not over, as we said, this KC-135 is gonna fly well into the future by great airmen in, in the footsteps uh, of our air, airmen today and the airmen we follow in the footsteps of. Uh, there, there's, there's a saying I saw this morning out there that uh, our Air Force has changed a lot over the years. And while this is not your grandfather's Air Force, this is your grandfather's aircraft, which is going to do great things for our nation. Uh, thank you all for coming out. We will be having a reception to follow over in the hangar. There'll be a, a static display there. I really hope you get a chance to come uh, socialize and celebrate this wonderful milestone in this incredible aircraft and all the airmen who have made it happen for six decades. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colonel Miller. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in the final round, final round of applause and appreciation of all the distinguished guests who have taken the time to join us this morning and recognize 60 amazing years of the KC-135 thus far. And with the recent avi avionic upgrade, this airframe will continue to refuel the fight for many, many more years to come. Please stand and join me in the singing of the Air Force song. And as a reminder, when the song ends, please remain standing for the departure of the official party. We also ask that you join us for the reception with cake, refreshments, and a static tour of the KC-135 and Hangar 1107 immediately following today's ceremony. Please follow the guys in the back towards the bus loop to bring you to the reception area and your vehicle. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.